In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I'd like to welcome you all here this morning to St Peter's Church as we gather to worship. And also, um, this morning is the first morning that we are using our new books that will be used during um, ordinary time. So that's all the Sundays after Trinity um, whenever we haven't got a special occasion, we will use these books. The Lord be with you. And also with you. And we say together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, the, the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than this. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Amen. Lord have mercy. God so loved the world that he gave his only son Jesus Christ to save us from our sins and to be our advocate in heaven and to bring us to eternal life let us confess our sins in penitence and faith firmly resolve to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all We say together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor, in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And the choir will now sing the Gloria. Oh, 
let us pray. Lord, you have taught us that all our doings without love are nothing worth. Send your Holy Spirit and pour into our hearts that most excellent gift of love, the true bond of peace and of all virtues, without which whoever lives is counted dead before you. Grant this for your only Son, Jesus Christ's sake, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. So we sit to hear our reading. Our second reading is from St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5. Brothers and sisters, we are always confident, even though we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. <coughs> For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yet you do, we do have confidence, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may receive recompense for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade others. <coughs> but we ourselves are well known to God. And I hope that we are also well known to your consciences. We're not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you an opportunity to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast in outward appearance, but not in heart. <coughs> for if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. The love of Christ urges us on, because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, so that those who live might no longer, and those who might live, live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. <coughs> from now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him now no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory, Glory to you, Lord. Such a large crowd gathered around Jesus that he got into a boat and began to teach them, using many parables. Jesus said, The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground, and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed will sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself, first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once it goes in with its sickle, because the harvest has come. Jesus also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet, when it is sown, it grows and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, it spoke the word to them, as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. May I speak in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Would you please be seated? Well, almost the entire chapter of Mark's Gospel that we heard this morning, it's all about seeds and sowing and their relation to the reign of God and God's kingdom. Our gospel gives us hope that God's reign is amongst us now, growing, living, moving towards its fruition, even if we do not know how. The first parable is about the seed that grows on its own, without help or manipulation. The growth of God's kingdom is mysterious, it's fruitful, and it cannot be controlled or managed. Now our human attempts at discipleship can only be fruitful when led, guided and directed by the Holy Spirit. Our role is not to manage God, but to join a God who is already at work in God's world. Now the reference to the harvest is from Joel 3 and it is an end time picture. We will know the fruitfulness of our own ministries at the last day when we are all judged. The second parable is about the growth of the mustard seed. It is no coincidence that this passage from Mark has been paired with Ezekiel for the lectionary. The growth of the kingdom as a mustard seed into a shrub is a reference to the end time vision mentioned from Ezekiel. While Mark makes reference to a shrub, in the other gospels Luke says it will grow into a tree and Matthew suggests it will become a great shrub and then a great tree. But Mark in his writing, well, he likes to be a little subversive. A shrub is lowlier than that high and mighty cedar. The vision from Ezekiel is the restoration of David's kingdom. And this vision from Mark would fall in line with that humble entry of Jesus into Jerusalem on a colt. 
God will reign over all things, but his kingdom, his kingdom will be established through humility rather than pomp or circumstance. But with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable will we use for it? Well, it's easy with gardening, growing and sowing thing. Do you know what? I planted so many flowers for the wedding of my son and Zoe. And due to the cold May, none of them, barring just one lupin, came out. None of them came out. So I was busy down, as you do, down Davis Brothers, grabbing all anything in flower that I could to place around the garden to try and make it look pretty. But now, two weeks after the event, of course, with a bit of sunshine and a bit of warmth, the garden is in full flower. Everything is blossoming. Everything is out. And it looks beautiful. And you know what? I can't wait when you can come round and see it, and hopefully it will be soon, sooner rather than later. We've spent all this time clearing all the debris, clearing out all which is no good, that has built up over many, many years, and we dug deep. And one of the things when we dug deep into the rectory garden was that we found old medieval glass, and the glass was actually the glass of the window behind us, which was taken out. I'm not the, I'm not the history buff, I'll leave that to Pete. But it was 18-something or other when that window was put in, and it was the window before that. And apparently they took it out, and all they did was just bury it straight across there. So that's where I found the glass. And the lead to the glass also where we were digging. Well, we've created huge vegetable areas, we've put the rockery in place, we've put a new patio in, and we've planted so many plants. And it's getting there. There is still a lot more work to do, and it's an ongoing work that involves obviously a lot of money as well, before that vision of what we had is completed. God has helped us to complete, well, to get on that road to complete that vision. But with what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will it be used for? Well, Jesus continues in his parable, he talks about the birds. And this is taken from Ezekiel 17, I can hear a bird now, when it was stated that they will find shade under the branches of a cedar tree. So who are the birds? Well, I can remember leading a children's ministry and I invited all the children to retell their favourite Bible story to a brand new member, a new child who had come along to the group. And then I invited the, the children to create a picture of that story. And this young girl chose the creation story. So, we had purple chickens, gold hens that lay glitter eggs, pink tarantulas, so much better I think, don't you? And they actually speak and they say, I'm so cute. A zebra that was orange and silver, a green monkey and a blue Flying pig. <laughs> Don't you just love her imagination? An enthusiasm for colour and for brightness. And I pray that it's never taken away for her as she grows in.